Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, red light is on, I guess we go. Good to see everybody back again from another coffee break. And for those of you joining us on television, if you're ever in the eastern Oklahoma area and uh, it's the first part of the month, call us and maybe you can come in for a taping. We've got folks here today from Tennessee and from Kansas and uh, my kids are down from Wisconsin and... Uh, we just know that people love to come in and spend an afternoon with us. All right, we're going to go right back to where we left off. And uh, we're talking about bringing in the tribulation, the final seven years. The church is gone. And uh, we have the appearance of the Antichrist that signs the seven-year peace treaty. But uh, we saw from Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, that the Antichrist is going to make his appearance. And uh, we were looking at the word seal, like sealing an envelope or sealing a document. And then I took you back to Revelation chapter 5, and that's where we're going to pick up now again on this half hour, is Revelation 5, and we're going to pick up this seal or these seals that are on this scroll that is really a symbolic uh, mortgage. And that's why I took you back to how did Satan end up holding the mortgage on planet Earth. Well, because you see the curse fell as soon as Adam fell, and Satan has been then the god of this world for 6,000 years. And I showed you the evidence of it. Uh, Paul called it the god of this world who keeps people blind. I showed you how Jesus offered all the kingdoms of this, or Satan offered to Jesus all the kingdoms of this world because under this present economy, he is the God of this world. But never forget, God is sovereign. He's still above him, but he's been letting him have free reign for these last 6,000 years. But his day is coming, and God is going to pay off his mortgage with all the horrors and the wrath of God in that final seven-year period. That's the whole purpose of it, along with, of course, chastising his covenant people. All right, so back to Revelation chapter 5, and picking up the symbolism of a mortgage. We might as well start over in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside and sealed with seven seals. Now picture them as they just go down the line of that scroll. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose, take the seals off of that mortgage. Verse 3, No man in heaven, nor on earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look thereon, because they were not qualified. They did not have the wherewithal to even consider paying off this mortgage. All right, verse 4, I wept much, John says, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll, nor to look thereon. Now verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. Now as I'm reading, I'm thinking, naturally. Yeah, i got to bring you back to Daniel. Come back to Daniel chapter 7. And again, I always do this only to show how beautifully Scripture fits with Scripture. It's not just some boondoggle that men have put together. It's not some story around the campfire like they try to tell us. But this is the divinely inspired, intrinsic Word of God. Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> starting at verse 13. Daniel 7, verse 13. 13. And just as you read, compare what you've just read and how it all fits. Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. The word Son is capitalized, so it's a reference to Christ. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, which would be another title for God the Father. And they brought him, that is, God the Son, before him, the Father. Now look at verse 14. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom 
that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. All right, now that when you come back to Revelation, this is the beginning of the end of time as we know it, but it's the beginning of the beginning of the eternal. All right, so now then, we have to go through those seven years of wrath and vexation to lift the curse and to pay off Satan's mortgage. All right, verse 6 of chapter 5. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. See, there is the same term again that we've seen before. The Lamb of God, God the Son. There stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he, God the Son, came and took the scroll, this mortgage, out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. Now, of course, when we taught the book of Ruth, we made the comparison how that the same way back in antiquity, when a piece of of ground was mortgaged, how it had to be the next of kin who could pay off the mortgage. It couldn't be a stranger. It had to stay in the family. All right, so now then we have the same thing here, see, that God the Son comes forward having all the requirements <clears throat> and has the power <clears throat> to pay off Satan's mortgage and the curse on planet Earth. All right, now then if you'll come back over to uh, chapter 11 in Revelation, I maintain, now I realize there are probably hundreds of books written on the book of Revelation. And I don't suppose any two of them would agree on every detail, so I don't expect everyone to agree with me, but I'm going to teach it the way I see it. And so I feel that while the Antichrist is signing this seven-year treaty in one part of Jerusalem, across town, there's another totally different scenario, but I think on the exact same day, the opening day of the seven years. While the Antichrist and the leaders of the Arab world and Israel are putting together their seven-year treaty in another part of Jerusalem, we have this scenario. Revelation 11. Verse 3, <clears throat> the appearance of the two witnesses. And I'll show you in a little bit why I put it at the opening day. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy or speak forth or preach or proclaim a thousand two hundred and sixty days. That has to be from the opening day to the midpoint that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. All right? And they'll be clothed in sackcloth. Now, these are the two olive trees. Now, a lot of people name them, and I don't even try. I'm not going to stick my neck out because the Bible doesn't tell us who they are, even though they seemingly are some clues. But since the Bible doesn't name them, I'm not going to. We're just going to leave it as two Jewish witnesses Yes, it could be Moses and Elijah. It could be Elijah and Enoch or any two of those three, according to the details, but I'm not going to stick my neck out. I'm just going to leave it as two witnesses. And they're going to speak forth for the first three and a half years. Now verse 4 again. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, but he's also the God of everything. Now verse 5, if any man would hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now I'm going to repeat again. As soon as we start this seven-year period of time, right from the opening bell, we're in the realm of the supernatural. Don't forget that. To sign that treaty is going to be a supernatural power of God to get all the parties to agree. Otherwise, it would never happen. These two witnesses are going to appear supernaturally. If it is two of these three characters in the Old Testament, then all the more reason to accept the supernatural. But whatever, don't ever lose sight of these things because these seven years are going to be way beyond 
the norm. All right? Verse 6. These two, whoever they are, have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now, that's why some scholars feel it's Elijah, because that's what he did. He caused a drought of three years in Israel's history. All right? And then the other one is likened to Moses, who had power over the water to turn them to blood, and they're going to have power to smite the earth with all plagues, the horrors of those opening three and a half years. They're not going to be a Sunday school picnic like I mentioned, I think, in the last taping. You've got to remember those first three and a half years, even though they are nothing compared to the last, yet it's going to be an awful period of time. One-fourth of the world's population will be gone by the middle of these seven years. Now, that's 1.75 billion people. That's a lot of human flesh. 1.75 will be gone by the middle of this seven years. All right, reading on. Verse 7, when they have finished their testimony... The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. In other words, this is the appearance of Satan in the empowered Antichrist. Will make war against them, will overcome them, and finally kill them at the end of the three and a half years. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. That's another term for Jerusalem, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, verse 9, And they of the people and the kindreds and tongues or languages and nations, in other words, globally, from one end of the globe to the other, will see their dead bodies three days and a half. Now, you know, when we first came in with satellite television, I thought, well, no, that's total fulfillment of this. But now one of my kids or grandkids the other day said, oh, Grandpa, it's one thing better. Now what has everybody got? Cell phone. And you know what I read the other day? Now I read a lot. You all know that. 50% of the world's population already own their own cell phone. 50% of the world's population. In other words, that's again, is almost three and a half billion cell phones out there. You know, when I was in the airport the other day, you know, and it just boggles my mind. Everybody in that airport is talking on their cell phone. Well, I have to wonder, <laughs> who keeps the lines from getting crossed? <laughs> but seemingly, they never do. But see, the technology is all here to fulfill this book. Without the technology, this wouldn't mean anything to us. But now we know what it is. Everyone is going to see these two bodies laying on the streets of Jerusalem, whatever time of the day it may be. See? All right. And they shall not permit their dead bodies to put in graves. But verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, make merry. They're going to be so glad that these two prophets, because what do you suppose the devil's message is going to be? All of our problems are because of these two guys. If it weren't for all their preaching, we wouldn't have all this turmoil. We wouldn't have all these plagues. And so when the earth hears that they're dead, they're going to celebrate, just like Christmas, see? All right? But they won't be put in the grave. That, again, is a God thing because they're going to rise from the dead at the end of three and a half days. Verse 11. So after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God, the supernatural, entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon all them who saw them. Well, that naturally would turn their attitude, wouldn't it? Now verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Nothing they could do. I mean, they're, they're gone. All right, now this brings us up to then the middle of the seven years, or at the end of 1260 days. Now verse 13, the same hour, at this very point in the middle of the tribulation, there was a great earthquake in the area of Jerusalem, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, which again is a pretty good-sized number for a city the size of Jerusalem. And... The, what's the word? The remnant. Now lock that one in. Underline it. Highlight it. 
the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, from what we've seen in the first half hour this afternoon, what is this remnant representative of? The one-third of Israel that we saw back there in Jeremiah and Zechariah that will survive these last seven years. All right, we can chase them down again in a minute, but just for now, underline your word remnant. This one-third of Israel. Now, most of you, I think, realize that the population of Jews in the world, the whole world, America, Russia, Canada, you name it, are 15 million. How many are in Israel tonight? Five million. Now, this is strictly speculation. Strictly. Does that mean that God already has pretty close to his five million for the third? I don't know, but it sure is tantalizing to think about that we may be that close that already that one-third is in Israel. All right, now, keep your hand in Revelation. I think I'll be back. I'm not sure. <laughs> Come back with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 9. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Now I'm bringing you back here for the sake of one word. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. All got it? Except or unless... The Lord of hosts, which again is God the Son, Jehovah, as Israel understood, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us, the nation of Israel, a very small, what? Remnant. Now, goodness sakes, when did Isaiah hold forth? Well, about 700 B.C., about 300 years after King David. And how many, percentage-wise, of Israel were still righteous and believers? Only a small remnant. Now, you can put the percentage on it. 2%, 3%, 4 That's all. And so it's always been this way, see? All right, you come all the way up to Matthew again. Come up to Matthew, chapter 7, I think it is. got to look a minute. Matthew 7, verse 13. Now, I may have used this not too long ago, and I'll probably use it again not too far into the future, because this is what we have to understand. This is where we are. We're not going to see multitudes. We're not going to see tsunamis of people become believers. It's not going to happen, because God has never had more than the small percentage, a remnant. All right, Matthew 7, verse 13. Verses that you know. You learned them back in Sunday school. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be who go in thereat, that is, in the wide gate. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, eternal life, and few there be that find it. Again, what's the word for the few? The remnant. See? God has always, all the way up through history, including the church age, he's had his remnant. Not the masses, the remnant. And we can see it more and more today as our denominations are going more and more liberal and uh, getting further and further away from the truth. But God is going to keep his remnant. See? All right. Now then, I think. You got your hand in Revelation yet? Flip back to it a minute. Just for a minute, and then we're going to go up to Matthew. So if you got Matthew, goodness sakes, keep it. <laughs> we're going right back to Matthew. But Revelation 11, where we just left off, verse 13, 
at the very midpoint, after the 1260 days of the preaching of these two witnesses, who have been put to death, been raised back and called up to glory, the same hour, that same midpoint, there was a great earthquake there in Jerusalem. The remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Who are they leaving out? Jesus Christ. Now you see, most, at least of Americans, Western civilization, do they believe in God? Most, sure. Yeah, they believe in God. They have some concept of God anyway. But is that what they need for salvation? Well, of course not. You don't get saved by believing in God. You have to have a relationship with God the Son, Jesus the Christ. All right, same way here. I look at this, that this escaping remnant, they're going to flee from Jerusalem now as a result of that, uh, of the earthquake in particular. But they're going to flee in unbelief. But God in his grace and mercy is going to keep his thumb on them. Now come back with me to Matthew 24. And I don't know if I'll have time to finish all this in this half hour, otherwise it'll just go on into the next program. But now Matthew 24 again, where we were earlier this afternoon, Jesus is speaking to the twelve, and all of this is with regard to the tribulation as it pertains to the nation of Israel. Now don't forget about that remnant. Matthew 24, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now again, just for a quick review, I won't make you till back there. What did Daniel 9 say? That in the middle of that week, in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist is going to go into that temple that Israel has enjoyed now for three and a half years, and he's going to defile it. He's just utterly going to shut it down and he's going to turn on the nation of Israel like no persecutor has ever done. Hitler will be nothing but a Sunday school figure comparatively. The Antichrist is going to bring in all the hatred at his command upon the nation of Israel. So consequently, God is going to spare his remnant. And as we saw in the first half hour, that remnant is what? One third. One third of Israel will be supernaturally taken out of the city to a place of safety. All right, now Jesus tells about it himself. Verse 16, Let them who be in Judea, that's Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. Now there's a lot of speculation of what mountains, but whatever, they're going to flee Jerusalem. Now verse 17, Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Well, now again, just use a little imagination. Here you've got somebody that's got a lot of beautiful things, and my, when he realizes that it's time to flee, the inclination will be to take something with him. But the scripture says, don't you do it. You haven't got time, see? All right, so he says, don't even think about taking something along. All right, and then next one. Neither let him who is in the field... Now, you've heard me qualify this. At the time of Christ, Israel was an agricultural nation. They were probably 95% rural and agrarian. They had their flocks and their orchards and their fields and so forth. Today, of course, Israel is cosmopolitan and it's urban. Very little of percentage-wise are in the agriculture. So the segment of society we're talking about today will be all the professional people, the business people of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Haifa and what have you. All right, so let them who are of the working class, those who are still out there making their living, neither let him within the field return back to take his clothes. In other words, time is of the essence, isn't it? All right, now we come over to the the female side of the population. Woe unto them who are with child. Let's repeat the word woe. Woe to them that are nursing in those days, carrying their little one. And then 
horrors of horrors, pray that it not be in the winter time. Now even this last winter, you know, Israel had some pretty nasty weather. They had a lot of snow and they had cold, miserable days. Well, pray that it won't be in that kind of a weather situation. And also that it's not on the Sabbath day. Well, why? Well, because they're back under the law. Now, of course, an Orthodox Jew today still holds the Sabbath, but uh, Israel in general could care less. But on this particular event, they're going to be all practitioners of temple worship once again, have been now for three and a half years. And so the Lord says, hope and pray that it won't be on a Sabbath day so that you'll be free to go to their place of safety. All right, now then, verse 21 for then, this day of escape, this midpoint of the tribulation, for then, from that point on to the end, shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. In other words, it's going to be beyond our human comprehension. Now, you know, I've shown you verses over and over. I think I've got time. One of the most graphic, of course, is back in Jeremiah. We used it uh, several times lately. But let me use it again, if I may. Jeremiah 25, and that'll take us to the end of the half hour. Jeremiah 25. This is just an inkling of the end of those three and a half years. And I'm going to have to read rather quickly. Jeremiah 25. Verse 31, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. And you've heard me say it. I think this is nuclear. All these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hydrogen bombs that are stockpiled around the world will finally come into play. They're not back there for nothing. They're not being collected just to be collecting. They're going to be used. All right, so a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh, and he will give them that are wicked to the sword that is death. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, a great whirlwind, which is another indication of nuclear force. A great whirlwind shall be raised up from the borders of the earth. Now verse 33. If this isn't graphic, I don't know what is. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other. They shall not be lamented, nor gathered, nor buried. They shall be as trash upon the ground. <coughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.